Good morning. I actually wrote something about this yesterday. The topic that I'm going to cover is listening to your horse when he's trying to tell you something. And in specifics um, about trailering. What your horse tries to tell you about trailering or what your horse tries to tell you about the trailer itself or, you know, what they already know that you might not know they already know. Um, so the other day, and I, so I wrote about it, and if anybody's like me, they would rather watch or listen to something than read. So there's a chance that you wouldn't get this material if you only found it in the written form. So I'm also doing it as a podcast today. Um, the other day, I had planned to trailer one of my clients over to utilize an indoor arena that we had um, opportunity to use. And uh, I was supposed to be at that location at 5 o'clock for two other horses that were being trailered in for me for lessons. So I had kind of a time in mind. But I asked Jasmine to bring, to, to arrive at my farm to, you know, get ready to trailer over uh, an hour in advance. So at four o'clock she was expected. She came at four as, as requested and that wasn't the big deal. Um, the people where she had purchased the horse, the horse is new to her new to, you know, to the farm and new to everybody. So we're all just kind of learning. We're still kind of, um, I haven't really had a chance to go sift through his box, which if you know anything about um, how I interpret a horse that has history as having a box where literally there's so much about them we don't know. So imagine that in like a sealed box um, you find up in an attic. I use a, a reference to a TV show called um, Storage Wars, but let's just say we found this box and it's sealed and taped and it has that horse's name on it. So let's say we have a box for Pax. I haven't taken the tape off of that box yet to, to get to know him yet, other than just for my daily routine stuff. So there's a lot about him I don't know yet. And there's a lot about him he hasn't showed us yet. One of the things I have noticed about him is that he has expressed um, some strength in obedience. Uh, he kind of quickly goes where you point him, um, very sensitive to a rain contact, seems to kind of just do as he's told. So there's like a level of obedience that um, sometimes I, I'm saddened to worry about, you know, how he became so obedient, uh, like what kind of training methods did he undergo to become that obedient. However, um, there are some displaced things that he's shown us as well. So there's some things that he does that um, need to be fixed. So one of the things is when you go to lead him somewhere and he's heading straight and he's decided, well, I kind of want to go that way. He's that horse that will bring his nose close to his chest and then flip it in the direction that he wants to go possibly in hopes to pull the, the rope out of your hand. Um, that's a behavior that's extremely rude. And, uh, you know, as I told Jasmine, we will fix that. I, I don't like a horse that does that. I find that just very disrespectful. Um, so, you know, he does have some behaviors that don't lead me to believe he was terribly handled in his training practices. Um, but I'm not going there anyway. So, where I'm actually going is, so here we are, I'm told, and based on his levels of obedience already, I'm told that uh, Jasmine was told that he ha he gets right on the trailer. You know, that um, you know he trailers fine or he trailer loads fine, um, and you know, no issues with that. So there was no reason, being that I didn't have to be 15 minutes away until 5 o'clock, there was no reason to load this horse at 4 if I know for sure or I'm confident in, you know, the um, information that was given to us that he'll just get right on the trailer. So at about 20 minutes to 5, 
No, I'm sorry. That's not correct. At 420 is when I said, okay, let's go get him and we'll put him on the trailer and whatever. So, you know, I was only giving us enough time to literally put him on the trailer and go. Uh, got him out to the trailer and um, he walked right up to the trailer with me. You know, you could tell his breathing was a little bit different, you know, out of apprehension. But he really wasn't saying, oh my God, what is that? You know, there was certainly familiarity to him. Then I get him to the trailer and he does kind of say, you know, I'll follow you. And because I'm a farm owner, manager, caregiver, etc., if there's ever an emergency here, and it's something that happens, say, in the middle of the night, and I'm the only one that's able to manage that emergency, and the horse needs to, in an emergency, get to a, a hospital, get to a, a veterinarian clinic. I need to know that every horse that I work with, that I care for here, can be just sent onto the trailer, allowing me to stay at the back of the trailer, to fasten the butt bar, to, you know, to get them in the trailer and safely ready for me to take them somewhere uh, by myself. So, generally speaking, I don't like to tie a horse until the butt bar is up because the pullback factor could be much more uh, tough on the horse in a trailering experience. If they pull back, they want to get out, they don't feel the butt bar, and now they feel like they're trapped by their face, you know, they feel you know, not only are they trapped in this box, which is squeezing them from side to side if you're in a straight load, and then um, now they're trapped by their face as well. They panic, but if they have a butt bar to hit, they kind of realize, no, I'm in here, you know, and they feel a little safer. So I like to make sure I get the butt bar up before I tie them. If I have to lead them into the trailer, well, now I'm in a position where I have to hope they stay there or tie them and then try to get to the back to get the butt bar up before that panic ensues. Um, I've not really had good luck with horses that way. I've not really felt that horses haven't said, yeah, I got in, now I'm getting out. I feel like horses generally say, yeah, I got in, but uh, I'm coming right back out. And when they wanna do that, they uh, have a tendency to do it in a panicked, more quick, you know, tucking their hind legs way under them and dumping their butt down a little bit and really, you know, digging in to get out. Um, I need horses to be able to just self-load with confidence, rope over their back or neck, and then as they get in, I do the butt bar, and then I go up and I fasten them. So all the horses that I trailer from here have to be able to self-load. Um, so he told me he would have followed me in. When I got there, he kind of had this forward momentum. Yeah, I'm willing to follow you, and I'm just going to follow you right into the trailer. And I said, okay, buddy, but I'm going to need you to just get in. And he kind of said, oh, I don't think I know how to do that. And when he did that, I was like, well, we got to, you know, I'm figuring a horse that knows how to just walk down with a person is going to be able to understand, well, this is still familiar to me. So I know I'm supposed to be in there and I'm just going to go in and it's okay. Well, he didn't really want to make that adaption. And um, while on the ramp at one point, he decided he was going to rear up and strike but he didn't strike like how horses strike like whew, you know where you didn't even see it coming he didn't strike like that he struck like high o silver you know he he just kind of like moved his front feet up around in the air so i i almost interpret that as him wanting to strike and then changing his mind whether he changed his mind because um he really didn't think it was necessary to show that kind of force or he changed his mind because he didn't have that much disrespect for me um I had another horse who was known to strike, and um, I watched him multiple times over the years where he would change his mind, and I do a million percent believe that it was because he didn't feel I deserved that disrespect. That yes, he was emotional enough to pop up in the air, and then, oh, I don't, you know, like he would reach out like he's going to strike, and then he would almost like bend his knee as tight as he can to say, I didn't mean it, you know. Um, and I, I totally took that as a very thought through decision to not follow through with the strike. Now, so this horse decided he's going to rear up and um, have this striking kind of 
attitude. And then um, I had to tell him that that's unacceptable. So I drove him backwards and told him in a very stern and very um, growly, no! Um, when you growl at a horse often, that's all you ever have to do. You don't have to beat them. You can just give them something to really like have resonate in their ears as being kind of a scary sound. Um, and then, you know, I don't hold grudges. So the correction back, the growl, and then, okay, now let's try this again. So again, he maybe got on the ramp. Now, of course, as all horses do, he figures out I can go to the side of the ramp, whatever. So I had to get strong with him in the sense that the wrong answer had to be uncomfortable. So I had a rope that as he stepped towards me, I would make that rope uncomfortable on his shoulder to let him know that he's come the wrong way. So anyway, we had a few experiences where he just said, yeah, no, and he would pop up a couple times and, um, you know, was corrected for that. So then finally, because now I'm aware of time, I say, all right, I'll just lead you on. So I started to lead him on and he started to come on. He got halfway on and then he decided while his head is in the trailer, now he's thinking about popping up again. For me, I'd rather push him back out of the trailer than let him rear up in the trailer. So I pushed him back out of the trailer, growled at him, backed him up the whole nine yards. Um, and then I said, all right, fine, we're not doing it that way either. So I told him to self-load again, and we had more of a conflict there again. So then I'm like, again, aware of time. This is really what I strongly want to say is don't ever do something where you think about time when it's something that could potentially affect your emotions. Now I started to become aware of time. I had somewhere to be. This horse was becoming... Um, a bigger project than I was set out to be prepared for. So uh, it was, I was becoming aware of time and um, I could tell that my, my, my con, like I always refer to people that have internal energy as like a shaken soda. I felt like I was beginning to fizz. Um, I wasn't full blown, like expanding and ready to blow up, but I definitely felt myself fizzing and I was just like, all right, um, I really need you to get on and we have this much time. And so I said, fine. And I like, felt like I conceded to fine, I'll lead you on. So I let him on and I'm, because I don't normally get in a trailer with a horse, I'm not really that quick about ducking underneath the chest bar. And when we got up there, I was kind of fumbling to get under the chest bar. And then, of course, he said, well, I'm in, but I don't want to be in. And he backed right back out. And, of course, I had to get back under the chest bar and follow him back out. I think I tried to self-load him again one or two more times. Again, rearing issues. Um, so then I said, fine. You know, again, I felt like I was conceding. And I think that energy was also reflective for him is that I was like surrendering, um, almost where he could have sensed a sense of defeat on my end, like he wins. So I decided, okay, fine, I'll lead you in. So I let him in. I struggled to get under the mount, under the chest bar. His owner was standing at the trap door instead of me being a better educator and a better instructor and saying, you know, once I get him on, get the butt bar up. That's where you should be standing, not up here watching me pull him in. Um, so once I got him in and I got under the chest bar, she took the lead rope from me and I went down the other side of the trailer, the other stall of the trailer to go put the butt bar up and he started panicking and pulling. And so, you know, I don't want him rearing in my trailer. So I hollered, let him go. So she did. And I caught him on his way out. So at that point I'm like, okay, you know, I said, Hey, next time we need you to stand at the butt bar and get the butt bar up. Cause that would have probably been an okay thing. Um, tried a couple more self-loading things, recognized that my, my bottle now was fizzing a little bit more than I was comfortable with and I had to go. So I just said, look, I'm sorry. You know, I gave it my, my best shot with a horse. I thought knew how to get on a trailer and, um, we'll have to just schedule a trailer loading lesson. We'll get him self-loading where he'll canter onto a trailer. Um, but today is not the day we're going to do that. So, uh, 
disconnected my trailer blew up. On my way to where I was going, um, I thought about it and I'm like, he told me when we first got there, what's familiar to me about this exercise is if you walk in, I follow. And he probably would have walked right on. Probably would have walked right on. I say that, but it doesn't mean that he would have backed right back off. I don't know. But he did tell me that that's the part that looked familiar to him. I need to teach him a different way, and that was not the time to teach him. So, and in that case, I added, like I said, my fizz, and now he's like, you know, timed out. He's like, nope, not, not having any part of this. So, and unfortunately, I quit with time on my mind, and I quit basically saying, you know, you didn't even try, we're not even here, we're not even leaving you on a good note, I gotta go. I don't do that. So, anyway. Him telling us, basically, that um, he knew how to get on the trailer a different way. And then me mixing it up and confusing him could have been the problem. Not saying that that would have really been the problem, but let's just say could have been a problem. I had another scenario, but I'm going to change stall so I can stay working. Um, so I'm going to push you pause, and then I'm just going to be in a different stall. But i got to keep working. Okay, so I hope that was simply just paused and I'm back. Um, I'm not really sure. I've never tried to do it that way. So the next horse was um, uh, let's see who would I use? Um, this horse named Tango. I was on my way back from a place that I work at as a trainer. Um, and I was probably halfway home, it's an hour away, and I got a phone call from a woman who I've worked with her other horse a couple times and even um, had him here for a few days. And uh, she called me and said her seasoned horse, her veteran trail horse, suddenly decided he's not going to get on the trailer anymore. In fact, so badly that she got him to the trail ride once and he wouldn't get on the trailer to go home and she actually had to contact her husband to come out and help get this horse on the trailer. Now this is her seasoned horse. This is a horse that's never had trouble getting on and off the trailer before, never had any issues. So I told her, you know, let me just stop and get something to eat and I'll be on my way. You know, I'll just come straight and won't even go home. So I did, I stopped at the quarter camp or whatever and, and uh, went straight to, to visit. And the trailer was already hooked up. And when I got there, um, you know, said hello to Laura and her friend. And, and then, uh, you know, got right to work, brought Tangle out to the trailer. And the first thing he said when I got about three feet away from the trailer is, something's wrong. So I told Laura, I said, he just told me something's wrong. And she said, well, I don't know what it would be because you know, nothing is different, nothing, nothing happened to him, whatever. And I'm like, well, you know, something, something's wrong. Something he's saying, something's wrong. Something, whatever, you know, like he, obviously I don't hear the words of the horse, but I can read the horse well enough to know that he's telling me something's wrong. Um, so, uh, she says, no, can't be anything. And I, I wanted so bad to, you know, you know, like, I believe in my heart the horses have no reason to lie. So, you know, I wanted to believe her, but I was really forced to believe him. But because she said nothing happened, I'm like, all right, let's 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 just see what, what's going on. So I asked him to go to the trailer and he says, yeah, no. And I asked him to go to the trailer and he says, yeah, no. And I do that <laughs> for about an hour. Before finally it was kind of accepted that I'm not getting him on the trailer today. And if you want, I'll come back and I'll do, you know, more concentrated with the intention of being here all day if I have to figure out what's going on with this horse and the trailer. So Laura, before I left, said, you know, she wanted to give it a try as far as getting him on. And, you know, with, with kind of my encouragement from behind, yeah, he got on. So I said, okay, well, good. Now we have, we have a starting point. So now let's 
get them on and off a couple times and let's see if we can't figure out what's going on as far as, you know, let's, let's at least re-educate him if that's what he needs. So she, uh, I said, go ahead and ask him to back out. Well, boom, that's where he told us. And I said, well, there it goes. When she asked him to back out, he rushed forward, panicked, scared. A horse that's used to being trailered, suddenly scared inside the trailer as soon as you ask him to back out. I said, well, he just told us what it was. I said, he's afraid to back out. Did anything happen? Did he step out funny or whatever? And she said, and that's when like the light bulb went on that yes, something actually was different. Because originally she said, um, you know, oh, he, he ever since I brought him, brought Helios to you, he's been weird about getting in and out of the trailer. I've been, it's been getting increasingly worse. And, you know, at first I was like, well, I don't know what bringing your other horse to me had to do with this, but, you know, it gave us a timeline anyway. And oh, I'm going to get another bucket. I'm a bigger pig today than he usually is. Um, but it gave us a timeline. And what that timeline offered us was when I told him, told us he's afraid to back out of the trailer and, you know, questioning whether or not something had happened, she said, ah, when just before she brought Helios to me, she had gotten the center divider fixed. But for a long time, she had not used the center divider. So Tango was used to being trailered free as if it was like a stock you know stock trailer free inside that trailer and then when it came time to unload he was allowed to just turn around and walk off the trailer you know nose first well his problem was he grew afraid of the floor dropping out from behind him he grew afraid of being told to back up and then having just, you know, back up, back up, and then boom, no ground, right? He recognized when he could see it from coming on it straight ahead, how and where the, you know, the ground changed, but he couldn't see it when he was being asked to do it blindly backwards. So clearly over time of not having that fear addressed, he said, well, then I'm just not going to get on, you know, I'm, I'm afraid of this. I'm not going to get on so that I can prevent getting myself in that position. Like he's just not going to get himself in that position again. It's kind of like a horse not willing to put his nose in an electric fence twice. You know, it's like, he's just not going to get himself in that position again. So that's the only reason this horse was refusing to get on the trailer was because he was afraid of something. And um, nobody heard what he was afraid of because it wasn't, the dots weren't being connected. Um, once we connected the dots, now we're in a position to help him. So what we did was we spent a little bit of time teaching him that we will tell you when you're expected to step down. We will tell you when, when the floor changes. Um, and we taught him that as you back him out, you tell him, step down. The actual word, step down. So that he can know when he's expected to feel the change in the, in the floor. Um, once you teach them that and they believe you, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the blind with uh, somebody, you know, telling them where, the, where to step up at a curve. You know, you can get this... What do they call that? Blind trust. You get this trust in, from them that they believe that you will not lead them into tripping on a curve. So that's kind of the concept here with the horse. Is we told him, don't worry, I will tell you when the ground's going to change. And this way, you're safe and, you know, and you can trust in, in me as you, your leader and as your caregiver and whatever. So, to my knowledge, I think like the next day or something, I got a really nice text message, you know, thanking me 
um, for, you know, finding that issue and, you know, to address it or whatever, and that they had gone out and he got right on the trailer and got right back off the trailer and got right on the trailer and got right back off the trailer. And to my knowledge, they have not had another issue since. Um, and no, I don't think, would she, should, should she have just taken the divider back out and trailered him this special way? If that's not how she wanted her trailer to always be going down the road, then no, you know, no, we'll teach him this way, you know. So that's, that's kind of where, listening to your horse again, this horse told me three feet away from the trailer, something's wrong. Might have been something different, but something's wrong. You know, you know. Sometimes when they look at something with their ears perked forward or whatever, especially when it's something that he's been asked to do a bunch of times, it's not really as new. You know, like when a horse sees uh, something moved in the barn and it looks different than it usually does, and they'll give you this "oh boy, something new" kind of expression on their face. He didn't have the "oh boy, something new" expression on his face, but he definitely had the, you know. Something's not normal here, something, you know, expression. So we had an opportunity to let him tell us. And uh, I'm so grateful that, you know, we did follow through and tell him, you know, if you get on, we'll find out what your problem is. And we were able to find out what his problem was. And I'm glad that we were able to work through it and help him and, and also strengthen the leadership skills of his owner and the trust that he had in his owner was was preserved. Um, because you gotta imagine if you're leading your horse into trouble or in their mind that they think, okay, so I'm gonna move this because I'm not even sure if before it paused. So we're just gonna move down here. But you know, you gotta realize that if your horse always trusts you and then all of a sudden, you lead them into danger in their mind, like danger, floor, floor disappeared. I had to take a really scary step down. Um, then they, they start to fear their trust in you, like their trust in you becomes questionable. Um, I don't know why I'm saying I'm a lot, sorry. So that horse had a chance to tell us something was wrong. And that's really the point of this whole podcast is to just let everybody know that your horse has talked to you. You know, he didn't necessarily say, well, let me tell you this. You know, he didn't, it wasn't that kind of talking to you. But when I approached the trailer, he gave me this, you know, not gave me, but gave the trailer this look and had a hesitation. He balked, but he didn't stop. He just gave me kind of a half halt, like, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to do this game. Um, I knew that he was telling me something was wrong. The one thing that I actually was upset with myself about was that because his owner was so sure that nothing was wrong, nothing was different, nothing had happened to him, um, I actually had a moment where I didn't believe him. And I actually had a moment where I felt like I was saying to him, just get on already. Um, I'm not, I don't really handle horses that way, so it, it's being expressed harshly much more than it actually was. It was my, a mindset of, you know, if, if there's nothing really wrong here, then you need to just get on this trailer. Um, because, you know, I was wanting to believe the human, even though the horse is no reason to lie. Um, so I'm so grateful that they actually heard him. And I, I feel disappointed that I did the one time I ever doubted a horse, he proved to me, see, you know, so like this way, it, was, it didn't prove to me that there's going to be times you should doubt a horse. You know, I didn't, I didn't walk away with a new understanding of, well, so I guess sometimes horses do lie. I didn't have that experience, but it was happening. I was beginning to believe that, you know, maybe he's just a horse who says, I don't want to do this anymore. I was beginning to believe that he just had this sudden desire to say, screw you, I don't want to do it anymore. And I, I wanted to I wanted to believe that he was lying to me, I guess. And I'm so glad that it turned out to not be true. And you know, my 
my faith in, in their communication skills is preserved. So the next horse, popcorn. I actually was at this farm for a different lesson with a different horse, um, but I happened to arrive when popcorn was getting ready to go to a show. And so I just kind of stood and, as you'd say, watched. And popcorn was, you know, basically saying, no, I don't want to get on, no, I don't want to get on. And Kate had said, Kate's who I was there for, had said that, uh, you know, oh, he's been doing this often now and it's really becoming an issue and um, they didn't know what was going on. And I saw right away, you know, if you say that he told me, like I say they tell me, it's, I read their body to know that they're trying to express that something's wrong. So that's why I always say, listen to your horse. So when I use the word, they told me, no, I didn't hear him say anything, but I believe I truly am blessed with the opportunity to know what they are trying to say in their body and how that can translate into words or into at least understanding on my part. So, anyway, he told me something's wrong, something's wrong. I saw right away what the problem was, but it was the young girl who was trying to lead, to lead him onto the trailer, and I didn't want to really correct her, you know, because she wasn't a student of mine, and she was on her way, on her way to a show of, you know, where she is a student. So it wasn't my place, if you will, to tell her what he was saying was wrong. Um, but then, out of frustration, I think, is when Kate had stepped in to say, you know, let me do it. And still the same issue. What he was doing that told me that what, what his story was, was he'd walk right through the trailer. And as soon as Kate stepped in the trailer, he'd go, and then he'd think about going in, and then he would stop. So, what he said was, I'm not used to seeing that, the person stepping up into the trailer, it's a step up trailer. So, it shocked him every single time, like, it, it didn't become something he got used to, it shocked him every single time she stepped up into the trailer ahead of him. So, I told her, I said, if you don't mind, I'll let you know what he's saying, and she's like, of course. So. I said, well, he doesn't want you to get in the trailer first. So just stand outside and ask him to get on. And at this point, you know, they're going to try whatever is, is maybe a helpful suggestion. So she stood outside the trailer, asked him to get on, and he climbed right on. They've never had a problem loading him since because all he needed was for somebody to hear him say, I self-load. I'm not familiar with watching the person get in there too. And that's making me uncomfortable. It was really that simple. And uh, I'm glad I have opportunities to be invited into situations where I can interpret. I always say I feel like a translator or a mediator between horses and their owners because I love being able to have the horse clearly show me what they need somebody to hear um, so that they can get results that they need for their own comfort and safety. Um, and horses are just so much more peaceful if you listen to them. They, they really don't need especially in trailers, trailer loading. Like I said, I felt myself fizzing to the point where I was like so aware of time and it was just, it was such an issue for me to be aware of time that then I became self-aware of myself. You know what I mean? Like I became aware of time. Then as I felt myself fizz, I realized now I'm becoming aware of myself fizzing and wanting to control that. And one of the things that I always tell people with horses is that when you go internal, you disconnect from your horse, and when you disconnect from your horse, you lose your connection. And your horse has no reason to trust you. You've, like, broken off the herd. Um, I felt myself disconnecting. I was able to reconnect and disconnect and, you know, 
But as I was becoming more and more disconnected, my frustration actually wasn't with the horse. It was with me and my awareness of time because as it was getting closer to my needing to leave, I was starting to tell the horse that you're running out of time. Um, and I was very aware of how that was shaking my bottle. So, uh, I, I loved having an opportunity to tell people if your bottle's shaking, you're not helping your horse and the horse probably tried to tell you something. Um, and then, you know, in my case, ran out of time and had to quit with a shaken bottle and actually probably got shaken even worse because now I'm panicking that I have to leave and I grabbed all my stuff except for I forgot a piece of this and I forgot a piece of that. So then when I got to my lesson, I wasn't even properly prepared. Um, so when you spin out, you spin out like that. Now I'm very aware of myself. Luckily, the only one I got to my lesson that I was supposed to do something that required my, my equipment. And I expressed that I had left two pieces of equipment at home that were gonna make it unable for me to do what I had intended to do. She was happy to do what we were able to do. And I was able to get connected back. And in fact, I had her do all the horse handling at first because I wanted to make sure, obviously this is a lesson for her and the horse, but also to calm my fizz, you know, let me open my cap a little bit and get rid of my fizz. Um, you're not good for horses, and I don't know how this got on this path, but you're not good for horses if your bottle's been shaken. You're just not, and sometimes in the process of learning how to be less shaken, you become self-aware of being shaken. And that's not healthy either for the horse because now you're internal. And being internal, being in your own head, disconnects you. And it could get you in trouble being in your own head truthfully because now you're thinking about you and thinking about, you know, and then the horse can be doing something that you're not even going to be uh, aware is about to happen because you weren't reading it. Because you weren't, you were too busy reading yourself or focusing on yourself. Um, anyway, so that's that. I'm not gonna, cause I'm going on a whole different subject now. Um, I have other horse trailer loading experiences that I could add to this, but I kind of jumped off and we'll go ahead and leave it with these three horses. Um, listen to your horses. And that was just really pretty poignant, um, examples of how horses try to tell us stuff. And, um, if we listen, we might have a conversation that matters to your horse.